So tonight we're going to be continuing uh, in our Discipleship 101, and we're going to be talking about beyond the external. And um, if you think about it, uh, it's not good enough with God to just simply do the external things. We also have to do the internal things as well, because God sees the heart. Uh, if somebody comes along and just simply does external things, but they don't have their heart in it, um, it really doesn't amount to much. You could probably think about an example of your own life when maybe uh, somebody went along and did something nice for you, but then later on you found out that they didn't really mean it at all. You know, when you found that out, it just simply didn't mean as much. Well, God knows the heart, and so, you know, He's not going to be duped into uh, thinking that we're doing good things when really the, the, the essence of it is that it's not good at all. So the Pharisees were ones that um, just simply thought that their righteousness was external, uh, something that they did. And if you recall, what we talked about last week is that Jesus said that the disciples' righteousness needed to exceed that of the Pharisees and the scribes, uh, or else they weren't even going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And so um, he also told his disciples that you know their righteousness needed to exceed that. So um, in looking at tonight's lesson, what we're going to see is six different examples that Jesus goes on to give to show about how um, he is there and what he requires is beyond what the Pharisees were teaching and what the Pharisees were doing. And what you're going to see is that in each and every situation, these different examples going down through chapter 5, is that it's going to say, you have heard, or you have heard that it was said, or it was said. And so that is something that um, the Pharisees were there doing and teaching. Now, sometimes it's going to be a quotation from the Old Testament law. Sometimes it's going to be a quotation from the Old Testament law, and then there are traditions that were mixed in there with them. You know, when you're in a situation where you've got um, looking solely at external righteousness and you can't do it, uh, you're going to be kind of trying to find some wiggle room in there and saying, okay, well, you know, even though the law says this, this is how I can justify it. And so um, the Jews came up with a series of traditions, both oral and written traditions, and they put those written traditions on equal playing field with the Old Testament law. And so, um, you know, Jesus, by coming along and saying, you've heard that it was said, and sometimes it would be a quote from the Old Testament law, sometimes it would be a quote from the Old Testament law and their traditions, he said, but I tell you, he's coming back and he's resetting things back to the original intent of where it was originally prescribed in the law. And he can do that because he is the lawgiver, and as what we looked at last week, he is the one that has fulfilled the law as well. Okay, so when you take a look at the very first question, very first question is this. Uh, take a look at each of the six examples that Jesus gave in Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 48. So when you look on the next sheet, you see we've got one, two, three, oops, there's three, four, five, six different examples. So when you look at those six different examples, um, can you find two examples where the Jews were mixing in their own words with quotations from the law? So two of these six examples have that. And so take a few minutes, find those and then circle them on the page, okay? So I'll give you a few minutes to do that. So now we're back. Um, two different examples, or two out of the six different examples, where the Jews were mixing in their own words with the Old Testament law. Do you, do you see them? I'll give, you a, I'll give you a hint. The first one is right up there at front, okay? All right. Here's, here's the formula right here, right? You have heard that the ancients were told, okay? And then he's going to go on to say what that was, and then he's going to say, but I say to you. Okay. So what we see of what the ancients were told is this. We've got, um, you shall not murder, 
boy, this is really not cooperating with me tonight. There we go. You shall not murder. Okay, now that is in the Old Testament law. Anybody take a guess where that's from? Okay, it is in Deuteronomy. It's also in Ten Commandments, in Exodus too. Ten Commandments are in two different places. So, you know, so we've got Ten Commandments right there, right? Do not murder. And then um, you see, you see how the um, New American Standard has this in all capital letters, or you know, capital letters, and then lowercase capital letters. I forgot what that's called. Okay, but then all of a sudden we've got something else here. Whoever commits murder shall be answerable to the court. Now, is that in the Old Testament? Nope. That is their words that they're mixing in, and that's what they're putting on equal weight with the Old Testament law. Okay. So there's one. Um, do you? Can you find the other one? What makes you say that? <laughs> the font. Well, the font. Ex well, that's exactly true. Yeah. Okay, so the last one is it. So here it is right there. There is, whoops. You shall love your neighbor. Is that in the Old Testament law? Yep, sure is. Okay, but what is not in the Old Testament law? Hate your enemy. Okay, and so... But you can see that what the scribes and the Pharisees were teaching them is both things. All right? In this situation, it was, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor, okay, and you shall hate your enemy. Um, probably what they were talking about was that in the Old Testament law, uh, or just in the Old Testament, you had people that were enemies of Israel, okay? And so the enemies of Israel were battling with um, uh, Israel, and battling with God, and so they probably looked at it and said, okay, well, yeah, you're supposed to love your neighbor, but the people that, that are our enemies, no, you, you don't have to love them. You can hate them. But can you see where this is going to be kind of a wiggle room, right? Love your neighbor. What happens if you don't get along with your neighbor? Then you're, they're, your enemy. they're your enemy, and so is it okay to hate your enemy? You can hate your enemy, and you can still be righteous before God. At least that's what they said. That's what they thought, right? Okay. So Jesus goes on to say, no, it's not that way. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those that persecute you. Now, going back to that first example there, and that is you were told you shall not murder, and whoever commits murder shall be answerable to the court. OK, um, I mean, when you look at it from a civil law perspective, I mean, that's not a, a wrong thing. It's that if you commit murder, you're going to be answerable to the court. Um, but is that the only place that somebody is going to be answerable to? No, you're, <laughs> you're going to be. Um, I, I, I hope that wasn't too dirty in there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, it's uh, uh, you, you never know when you when you go and you pick up a Kleenex that a little kid gives you. You never know what you're going to get. It's a it's a surprise. Yeah, unpleasant surprise at that. Okay, so back to this. Um, you know, uh, you shall not commit mur or you shall not murder. But whoever commits murder will be answerable to the court. Well, you're not just simply answerable to the court. You're answerable to, to a higher power. You're answerable to God. And that's what the, the uh, main thing was. And so if you look at verse number 22, you see a little bit more about what Jesus was talking about here. He says, but I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be answerable to the court. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing shall be answerable to the Supreme Court, and whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. All right? Um, you can see that somebody could look at the Ten Commandments and kind of see that, um, you know, to justify yourself before God, it's like, well, I've never committed murder, right? Right? And so, therefore, I'm, I'm righteous before God. I mean, can you say that? Can you say, I've never committed murder? I told you 
<laughs> okay, that's not murder. That's that's being merciful to all the rest of us. Um, but um, but um, I guess that's more mosquitoes. But anyway, um, back on track. You know, if you think about it, um, you know, somebody if they just simply looked at it in that regard of saying, you know, you, you don't commit murder, so therefore you're you're okay with you and God. Um, that does take care of the the external situation, but it doesn't take care of, of what's inside of a person. Um, have you ever been angry with a person? Okay. Um, that's what God's looking at, right? And so somebody can say, hey, I'm, I, I'm not a sinner. I don't commit murder, but, you know, you can, quote, unquote, murder people in your heart, right? Um, and so that's why he's saying here is that, you know, if somebody goes and uh, commits murder, they or is angry with this brother, he's going to be answerable to the court. If somebody who says you uh, good for nothing, which is um, um, in Aramaic, it's it's a uh, um, raka, um, just simply somebody who's, um, you know, not worth anything. It's going to be answerable Supreme Court, and so it's a little bit of a step up, and whoever says you fool will be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Um, I've heard people say, oh, we'll never call somebody a fool, never call somebody a fool. But I think that what Jesus is talking about here is saying that, you know, the righteousness that we need to have before God is a righteousness that's, that's not just simply on the outside of doing, it's on the inside, Right. Because we've got to have a righteousness that comes from the heart before we can start to really control our mouth and we can control our actions and everything. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, going on, we're going to talk about those other couple of verses in just a mo moment. But getting back to our questions here, um, take a few minutes and circle the El Old Testament quotes in the other examples. Okay. So just take a couple of minutes and go down through these other, well, I'll tell you what, we'll just do it right here because I think we can just kind of do it together. Um, we've got the first example and the sixth example of what we're talking about, but where in the second example is it to where uh, it is just the Old Testament quote? Remember, look for the capital letters. This is easy. You shall not commit adultery. Where's that at? Ten Commandments. That's easy enough. Okay, what about the next example? Where is the Old Testament quote there? Yeah, where's that at? <laughs> That's actually in the book of Deuteronomy. I, I can't remember the exact chapter, um, but uh, this is something that Jesus talked about in um, Matthew chapter 19. Um, and so um, what he said was that originally it, it, this was not what God wanted. This was something that God put into the Old Testament law um, because the hardness of the Israelites' hearts. And so if there was a situation where, um, you know, a, a, a wife was found to have committed adultery uh, or something like that, then they could give her, uh, her a certificate of divorce and, and send her away. By the way, um, wives back in that day and time could not give the husbands a certificate of divorce and send them away. Um, it was the husbands that would give the wives a certificate of divorce and send them away. Okay. What about the next one? Right. Okay. And so uh, in the Old Testament, you had a situation where you could make vows to the Lord. And if you made a vow to God, God expected you to fulfill that vow. And so, um, you know, you, you, it was very foolish to go and, and make a, uh, um, a false or a, a rash vow before the Lord. What about the next one? Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Uh, have you heard that expression before? Yeah. Did you know it came from the Old Testament? It did. Okay. And what it was is that um, basically the, the crime needed to fit the punishment 
or the punishment needed to fit the crime. And so whatever the crime was, uh, the punishment had to rise to the occasion. And so that is, you can't let somebody off with a light punishment if they've committed some kind of grievous crime. And you also cannot give somebody a very harsh punishment if they really didn't do anything that lived up to it as well. Okay? All right. So um, getting back to our question here, can you... Um, Let's see, question number two. Although Jesus didn't specifically say how the Jews were distorting the laws of ten, can you see how these things would have been twisted into justifying sin? So let's go back and take a look at you shall not commit adultery. Okay? Um, what is committing adultery? You know, if you were a lawyer and this was the law, um, you could probably try to debate on what adultery was not, right? You know, of saying, oh, well, this really was not technically adultery because it does not rise to that level of an occasion of it, okay? Kind of putting it into, uh, you know, the context of, uh, you know, how far a guy gets with a girl with first base, second base, home plate, and everything like that, you know, is getting to first base, Committing adultery. Is committing adultery second base? Is committing adultery third base? And you can see where they would kind of uh, have arguments and they would actually have a very, very graphic description of what would constitute adultery and what would not constitute adultery, which I'm not going to go into. But the point is just simply this um, committing adultery is playing the game altogether. Right? It doesn't matter how far you get. What matters is that you're there trying it. You're, you're playing it. And so that's why he says, you know, whoever, um, you've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And so you see how there's that idea about somebody can be filled with adultery in their heart, but yet... And then, you know, start to act on that um, desire, but because they are not actually technically in the act of adultery, they can say, I'm righteous before God. And if you really stop and think about it, that, that really defeats the whole purpose of things, right? Okay. Um, moving on down, who, it was said, whoever sends his wife away is to give her a certificate of divorcement. But I tell you that everyone who divorces his wife, except for the reason of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Now, what the original intent was, is like it says there, um, you know, that it was there for the reason of sexual immorality. Um, but the way it was worded in the Old Testament is that if um, there was some sort of uncleanliness with the wife, all right, and so what the Jews of Jesus' day would do is to kind of amplify that uncleanliness of the wife or that he, she displeased the husband. And they would say, okay, now I have a, a justifiable grounds before the Lord to divorce you. And so, you know, if, if I, I come home and I don't like the dinner that you've cooked, um, or, you know, if I come home and I, I don't like this about you, then they could amplify that and you can see how they would twist it around and they would excuse their own actions to say, um, I'm doing this and I am justified before God about doing it, right? And so you can kind of see in these examples here, here, here is the Old Testament law that's given but what they're doing, even though there's not, you know, the, the, the traditions that are there, they're, they're twisting and distorting it and wiggling it around. Um, moving on down, you've heard that it was that the ancients were told, you shall not make false uh, vows, but shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. But I say to you, take no oath at all, neither by heaven, for it is the throne of God, nor the earth, it is the footstool for his feet, nor Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. So what they're doing is they would say your vow that you take, if you say that you vow by God 
um, you, you can't vow by God because that's too much. And so, um, but if you could vow by, you know, this and the, the degree by which you would make your vow from God down to yourself um, would depend on how well you could keep your vow. And so if you told somebody, you know, if you told somebody something and they say, I, I, I don't know if I believe you, swear to it. You know, you could say, well, I swear by my left pinky toe that I'm telling the truth. Okay. Well, if somebody told you that, how much would you rather, you know, want to believe them? So uh, left pinky toe, mm, you know, can you really... Uh, do without your left pinky toe. But if somebody were to come up and say, I swear by the great city, Jerusalem. So, oh, well, that makes more weight. And so he's saying, you know, here's the system of, you know, depending on what you include in your vow depends on how serious you are about your vow. Okay. But wait a minute. What, what is the whole point of the whole matter? Right. You know, if, if you tell a falsehood with a small vow, it's still a falsehood. If you tell a falsehood with swearing by something great, it's still a falsehood, right? It's still wrong. It's, 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 it's still a sin. And so because of that, what we see is that he says this, um, nor shall you make an oath by hair of your head. You cannot make it single hair, white or black, but make sure your statement is yes, yes, or no, no. Anything beyond this is of evil origin. In other words, just make your words count. If you, if you tell somebody yes, it means yes. If you tell somebody no, it means no. You know, don't try to tell somebody yes and really mean no, and don't tell somebody no when you really know the answer is yes. I mean, just simply be honest um, in what you're doing. And so you can see how the Jews would have twisted those things around, right? By the way, I'm, I'm going pretty fast on this. Um, anybody got any questions or anything about this? Everybody, you know, with me and understand what I'm talking about? Okay. And so going down to that eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, um, he says, but I say to you, do not show opposition against an evil person, but whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn toward uh, him the other also, or turn the other toward him also. If anyone who wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak also. Whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him two. Give to uh, him who asks you and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. So here is this Old Testament law of an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, was really meant for civil judicious proceedings. You know, somebody commits a crime and therefore the punishment has to be in line with the crime. But what the um, Jews were doing is they were taking something that should have been a civil matter and they were making it a personal matter. And so they were using this as a justification for revenge. If you do something to me, then I have the right under God to do something of equal proportion back to you. And so if you poke out my eye, I have a right under God to poke out your eye. If you hit me and knock out my tooth, I therefore have a right to hit you and poke out your tooth. Okay? And so you can kind of see that, you know, this whole idea is really justifying, you know, kind of going back to the idea about, um, you know, being angry with your brother. Um, this is, a, is an opportunity for people to be angry and to seek vengeance upon the people that have uh, supposedly done things wrong to them and thinking that God's okay with, with all of it. And, um, and he really isn't. Okay? All right. So there's, there's those examples. And do you have an idea at least about here we've got an example of Old Testament law and how the Jews were wiggling and distorting it in order to make it appear that, yes, we are keepers of the law and we're doing things right, but they really weren't doing things right. They were wiggling things around in order to, uh, to justify themselves. And kind of getting back to what Jesus said in verse number 20 is that your righteousness, that is, you disciples, you know, your righteousness needs to exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees, right? Okay. Let's take a look at 
the next question. Let's take a look at Matthew chapter 5, verses 23 and 24. Okay? So, going back up here, 23 through, um, really, 26. Therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar, and there you remember that your brother has something against you, why would your brother have something against you? You did something wrong to hurt them. That's right. Um, leave your offering there before the altar and go first be reconciled to your brother and then come and present your offering. Come to good terms with your accuser quickly while you're with him on the way to court so that your accuser will not hand you over to the judge and the judge the officer and you will not be thrown into prison. Truly, I say to you, you will not come out of there until you have paid the last quadrants or the last pennies if you will, the last sense. And so if somebody has something against you and you, you let the matter go um, and it is something that is of a, um, you know, civil offense, you know, they could go and press charges against you and then you could be thrown into prison and that you'd be imprisoned until you paid the fine and you're not getting out of there until you paid the last penny. Is that what, that's what that is talking about. So looking at, at that, um, from this, does our relationship with others affect our service to God? In what way? What did Jesus say? If somebody has something against you, what should that person do? Before what? Right. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So, so before you go and you do whatever religious service you have for the Lord, in this case, in the Old Testament, because we're still talking about time, the Old Testament time period, even though this is in the New Testament. But in this situation, it is you need to go and you need to first work things out with your brother before you come and offer up your sacrifice. Leave your sacrifice there. Go take care of that. And then things are going to be cleared up between you and God. In other words, if you go and you make your sacrifice to the Lord and you've got some problem with somebody else, then your sacrifice, even though the priests accept it, um, it's not going to be accepted to God. Okay? So we don't have sacrifices um, today, but can you think of some modern examples where this would apply? I think so. Um, uh, you know, we're, and we're going to talk about this in a couple of weeks, but when we look at the model prayer, it's saying that if you don't forgive others, then your Heavenly Father isn't going to forgive you. And so there is an example of, um, you know, what we do with other people really does affect, um, you know, our service with the Lord. And so if if our lives aren't what they should be with other people, then our prayer life isn't going to be what it should be either. Um, one example of this, and I guess this is uh, a, a applying for Quentin and myself, um, is that in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 7, uh, it talks about how husbands, and so, you know, Quentin, this is, uh, this is for you and me. Um, in 1 Peter chapter 3, you know, husbands need to live in a way that is understandable, live with their wives in an understandable way. And the reason for that, it says, so that your prayers may not be hindered. And so, you know, if, if I, I'm not living with, a, a, you know, Shannon in an understandable way, 
then I'm not doing what I should be doing before the Lord, and then therefore, you know, my prayers are hindered. Um, a long time ago when I was a young man who wasn't even married then, I heard this uh, uh, Sunday school teacher talk about it and say something like, you know, I felt like my prayers have been, you know, going up, hitting the ceiling and coming right back down on my head. And then it hit me, oh, it's, I need to be living with my wife a little bit better than I am. And I don't know why that always struck me, but, you know, you know, praying and then having your prayers go boop, boop, <laughs> in the ceiling and come right back down. But I mean, it, that, that applies, right? Um, one thing that I thought of is, um, you know, since we had the Lord's Supper this past Sunday, one purpose of the Lord's Supper is that we need to make sure that we're in fellowship with God. And we need to make sure that a, a church is in fellowship with each other, you know. And the Corinthian church was a church that was divided against each other. And because they were divided as they were taking the Lord's Supper, the Lord judged the church. And there are some people that were sick and some people that were feeble. And then some people had even gone and died because the situation was so serious. And so that was a situation where people needed to make sure that they were in fellowship with each other before they came and took the Lord's Supper. And so, you know, I kind of thought of that as a little bit of, a, of an application. Anybody else think of, a, of another application? Okay, well, um, we'll stop there, and we will continue on with the fourth little bullet point next week. Okay?